By now, he must have Octavian. You yourself said he rammed Octavian's ship. Centuries before Elizabeth I, Cleopatra showed women's capacity for leadership with intellect, elegance, and occasional ruthlessness. However, historical accounts of her life are heavily fictionalized, blurring the line between fact and fiction. So let's discover the truth and take a look at some weird things you didn't know about Cleopatra. Number 19. She wasn't Egyptian. Starting off our list at number 19, did you know that Cleopatra wasn't actually an Egyptian? Cleopatra was part of the Ptolemaic dynasty, a dynasty which came from a general who served under Alexander the Great, named Ptolemy I. That means they were Greek through and through, speaking Greek and taking part in Greek customs all along the way. History says that after Alexander the Great retired in 323 BC, the Ptolemies ruled Egypt for about 300 years. However, this begs the question of how Greek troops even came to rule Egypt. Well, they conquered it. That's what Greeks did for fun back then, and surprisingly, the Egyptians didn't mind their rule because they were sick of the Persians who were presiding over them before. Now, coming back to the Ptolemies, they were pretty stubborn about sticking to Greek to the point where they wouldn't bother learning Egyptian, which is why you see both Greek and Egyptian on the Rosetta Stone. However, Cleopatra was different. She immersed herself in Egyptian culture, learned the language, and even styled herself as the reincarnation of the goddess Isis. Number 18. Her entrances were extravagant. Now, moving on, Cleopatra was all about the theatrics. She saw herself as a living goddess and was all about making a grand entrance to impress allies and show off her divine status. This sort of fancy for theatrics was on full display in 48 BC. She needed to meet with Julius Caesar, who was in Alexandria, but her brother Ptolemy XIII was causing drama. Ptolemy wouldn't let Cleopatra meet Caesar as his forces would get in the way. So what did she do? She had herself rolled up in a carpet and delivered straight to Caesar's room. When Caesar eventually got to see Cleopatra in her beautiful royal attire, he was impressed. But it wouldn't be until she actually started speaking that she would completely win him over. With the sound of her wonderful voice, she captured the heart of Caesar, and the two became a power couple which we'll get into more later in the video. For now though, here's another example of Cleopatra pulling the same kind of stunt with Mark Antony in 41 BC, where she sailed into Tarsus on this massive, shiny barge with purple sails and oars that look like they're made of silver. Her attire for that day was modeled after Aphrodite, the goddess of love, while she herself sat under a gilded canopy. Her crew, dressed as little cupids, fanned her and wafted around incense. The person she was dressing to impress, Antony, didn't stand a chance because he was smitten on the spot. And while Antony and Cleopatra were from two separate families, the same couldn't be said about her parents. Number 17. She was born from incest. Now let's talk about royal family trees and how they're more like royal family wreaths. Incest wasn't just a quirk that would happen from time to time for the Egyptians. It was pretty much preferred. Even though incest was commonplace in every royal family in the Middle East and Europe, the Egyptians took it a step further because of their mythology. You see, in their myths, Osiris married his sister Isis to keep the royal line pure. Because they were gods, they didn't have to worry about awkward family reunions or problems with genetics. However, humans on the other hand would run into these problems, and because the pharaohs looked up to these gods, they were bound to mimic their practices. So when the Ptolemies took over, they thought incest was a great way to keep the royal line pure. So by the time Cleopatra came along, her genes were a real family affair. Her father was probably King Ptolemy XII, and her mother might have been his sister, or maybe some other relative. It's a bit of a mess. Unfortunately, this practice would continue even with Cleopatra as she ended up marrying both of her younger brothers. Number 16. She led her navy into battle. This next one isn't as weird as it is impressive. We're talking about the time Cleopatra led her navy into battle. This started back when Cleopatra and Mark Antony tied the knot, proceeded to have three kids, and stirred up quite the soap opera in Rome. Antony's nemesis, Octavian, used this fact to his advantage and sprinkled propaganda into the mix by painting Antony as a lovesick traitor under the spell of the cunning enchantress, Cleopatra. The Roman Senate was so riled up they declared war on Cleopatra in 32 BC. 
The next year, the conflict came to a climax down at Actium, where Cleopatra wasn't just cheering from the sidelines, she was out there leading her 12 Egyptian warships right alongside Antony's squad. Despite their combined might, they were outgunned by Octavian's fleet, and the situation went south fast, resulting in Cleopatra and Antony having to cut through the Roman lines and retreat back to Egypt. Number 15. She wasn't beautiful, but it didn't matter. Now let's talk about Cleopatra's looks where it turns out she wasn't the beauty queen she was always made out to be. In pop culture especially, she has been depicted as a knockout beauty. However, in 2007, a coin was unearthed with Cleopatra's face on it, and she looks pretty ordinary. This is actually pretty consistent with historical accounts as ancient historians weren't hyping up her looks, which means she probably wasn't a head-turner like her depictions would have us believe. However, at the end of the day, how she looked didn't matter. It was her actions and personality that did. Plutarch, an ancient biographer who wrote Life of Antony in 75 AD, said her beauty wasn't drop-dead gorgeous, but her personality was totally spellbinding. On top of that, Cleopatra was exceptionally intelligent. She was into mathematics, medicine, alchemy, economic, history, and geography. What's even crazier is the fact that she could speak nine languages. So, Cleopatra was much more than just a pretty face, because she had the brains to back it up. Number 14. She bathed in donkey's milk. Next up, here's a weird thing you didn't know about Cleopatra, and it's the fact that she used to bathe in donkey's milk. The reason for this was the fact that she just wanted to avoid those pesky wrinkles. However, back in her day, there were no fancy clinics or miracle injections to keep you looking fresh. Despite the lack of facilities, Cleopatra was queen. And being queen, she had the means to go all out on beauty treatments that we common people couldn't even dream of. So her go-to spa day was a bath in donkey's milk, believe it or not. And she didn't just need a few donkeys, we're talking about a whopping 700 lactating ones daily. Now it might sound like Cleopatra was just making work for her servants, but this donkey milk practice was a legitimate beauty hack back then. It wasn't just her. Women all over were into it for that porcelain skin and wrinkle-free look. Even Emperor Nero's wife was on board, hauling donkeys around to keep up with her beauty routine. Fast forward to today, and science backs up the benefits of donkey's milk. It's great for people with cow milk allergies, and it's still used in beauty products. Yet people today aren't going as far as dumping gallons of it in their bathtubs to take a dip into it, as that would be financially irresponsible. Just like how financially irresponsible the Cleopatra movie was. Number 13. She was depicted in one of the most expensive movies of all time. Now, some big names in Tinseltown have played Cleopatra, but nobody did it quite like Elizabeth Taylor in the 1963 classic Cleopatra. Unfortunately, though, that movie was a hot mess behind the scenes, with the budget blowing up from $2 million to a whopping $44 million due to script and production issues. Furthermore, $200,000 of that was just for Elizabeth's wardrobe. That film went down in history as one of the priciest films ever made. And though it made a fortune at the box office, it almost made the studio go broke. Even accounting for inflation, it's still one of the most expensive films ever made. It makes sense though considering the crazy life Cleopatra lived, like her knowing roughly eight languages in total. Number 12. She spoke many languages. Coming to our next fact, we know that Cleopatra's beauty went beyond her appearance. She was a very intelligent queen, too. She chatted in Greek as easily as you might speak in English, but that was just the start, as she also knew the language of all her neighbors. We're talking Arabs, Jews, Syrians, Medes, Ethiopians, Troglodyte, Parthians, you name it. Furthermore, she was the first in her family to actually bother learning Egyptian as before her, the Ptolemies didn't care about Egyptian culture at all. They preferred to just stay in Alexandria, which was pretty much the Greek hotspot of Egypt. As such, Greek became the main language of Egypt as it was used in government and commerce. So while the other Ptolemies were lazy about learning Egyptian culture, Cleopatra was the opposite. Not only could she speak Coptic, but she could read hieroglyphics too. Moreover, she totally embraced the Egyptian lifestyle and fashion, dressing up as one of them and attending their festivals. She was so popular with the people that she became their favorite, even though she wasn't a born and bred Egyptian pharaoh, but that didn't matter. She was so entrenched in their culture that people couldn't help but see her as one of them, and it also explains why so many people today might mistake her for being Egyptian herself. Number 11. She slayed many of her siblings. 
Although Cleopatra was popular with the people, she definitely wasn't the best sister in the world, being ensnared in royal family drama again and again. In Egypt, ruling alone was not a possibility because pharaohs needed a partner in crime, or in this case, a co-regent from the family. And let's just say, Cleopatra's family reunions were deadly. She wasn't about sharing the throne, so she made sure her siblings were out of the picture. To illustrate this, let's go back to the start when Cleopatra began ruling alongside her father, Ptolemy XII, until he passed away in 51 BC. Before he passed, his last wish was for Cleopatra to tie the knot with her little brother, Ptolemy XIII, who was just 11 at the time. It may have only been a ceremonial act, yet the two siblings weren't on the best of terms with one another, especially when Ptolemy XIII tried to snatch the throne for himself. Cleopatra was not about to give up the throne so easily, so she called on Julius Caesar to step in. This also led to the two of them hitting it off and becoming lovers, which didn't sit well with Ptolemy XIII, as he wasn't thrilled about sharing power with his sister under Caesar's orders. The sibling rivalry came to a head at the Battle of the Nile, where Ptolemy XIII ended up drowning while trying to get away. So she didn't directly unalive her little brother, but she definitely played a major part in it. However, things got even worse later on with her other brother. We know that Egyptian rules made it very clear that a co-ruler was needed, and Cleopatra was no exception. So she married her other brother. Unfortunately though, soon after the marriage, he passed away due to mysterious circumstances. It turns out that Cleopatra had him poisoned. Even her sister Arsinoe was not free from Cleopatra's wrath, as Arsinoe sided with Ptolemy during the feud, and even claimed the throne for herself. Cleopatra wasn't about to let that slide, so she had Arsinoe executed. Needless to say, familial love didn't stop her from being brutal. Number 10. She made herself out to be a goddess. Next up, did you know that Cleopatra literally thought that she was a goddess reincarnated? She told everyone she was Isis in the flesh, which was a mix of self-promotion and a smart political move. Mark Antony didn't want to miss out, so he claimed he was Osiris on Earth. In legend, Isis marries her brother Osiris, so just like in reality, Cleopatra and Antony were married to one another. Although she was often known for adopting the persona of the goddess Isis, she was not exclusively devoted to this role. In fact, she had a history of taking up the role of various deities as the occasion demanded. For instance, during her first meeting with Mark Antony, she chose to present herself as Venus, the goddess of love, aboard a fragrant ship. This spectacle included young boys as cupids and the maids as sea nymphs in attendance. Suffice it to say that Antony was thoroughly charmed by this display, even though it sounds completely ludicrous today. Number 9. She wasn't supposed to be queen. For our next fact, did you know that Cleopatra was never supposed to ascend to the throne? Initially, her elder sister Berenice was the apparent heir to the throne, yet her untimely demise shifted the line of succession to Cleopatra. She got the royal treatment education-wise and made it her mission to know Egypt inside out, preparing for the day she'd rule. When she became queen at 18, after her father's death in 51 BC, she didn't just sit on the throne, she hit the road meeting her people. Her fluency in Egyptian, a rarity among the Ptolemaic dynasty, earned her immediate admiration from her subjects, which was no easy feat. It was because of this popularity that she managed to get away with some pretty crazy behavior, like even starting her own drinking club with Antony. Number 8. She and Antony started their own drinking club. Although Cleopatra was serious about ruling her subjects, she didn't shy away from a good time. She was sharp, savvy, and knew how to throw a party. She and Mark Antony, her husband after Caesar's exit and some convenient accidents that left her single, didn't let politics get in the way of fun. These two took their love for fun to a whole new level by establishing a private club they dubbed Inimitable Livers. The name itself is a playful nod to the dual meaning of livers, which could imply either the essence of life or the very organs that would be put to the test by their indulgent festivities. The club wasn't just any ordinary gathering, though. It was a tribute to Dionysus, the deity of wine and merriment. So while officially honoring the god, it also served as the perfect cover for what were essentially extravagant nightly celebrations. These weren't your average get-togethers, but elaborate feasts accompanied by copious amounts of wine, leading to some rather wild behavior. 
Then, after the official events, Cleopatra and Antony would often take to the streets of Alexandria, their spirits high and inhibitions low, engaging in playful pranks on the unsuspecting locals. It's a stark contrast to the buttoned-up image of modern-day leaders, who can never be imagined engaging in such uninhibited antics. Talking about uninhibited antics, though, Cleopatra may have inherited these things from her father, who was just like her in his taste for festivities. Number 7. Her Father Loved Music it turns out that Cleopatra's taste for music and celebration may well have been inherited from her father, Ptolemy XII. Despite his less-than-stellar reputation as a ruler, he was deeply passionate about music, earning him the moniker Olet, or the flautist. He considered himself a reincarnation of Dionysus and was often seen performing during public festivities, much to the delight or dismay of his subject. See, Cleopatra's father wasn't exactly the poster child for great leadership, as his reign had its fair share of chaos and economic turmoil, and it seems his heart wasn't really in it. He was more into music than managing a country, and it turns out the love of music was passed on to Cleopatra, who was all about family loyalty. Despite her father's shortcomings, she was known as Cleopatra Philpator, which means she who loves her father. She stuck by him right up to the end, earning her the reputation of a devoted daughter. However, her father wasn't the only thing she was devoted to in her life, and when it came to Beth, she was committed to winning them at all costs, even if it was a million-dollar one. Number 6. She spent millions on a single meal. For this next entry on our list, let's take a dive into the story of how Cleopatra spent a ridiculous amount of money on a single meal. See, Cleopatra's approach to her wealth was of a different kind, quite literally, to make a point. The story goes that Cleopatra bet Mark Antony she could spend 10 million sesterces on a single meal, which is about 10 to 20 million dollars today. Instead of throwing a large banquet or feast, she had a simple meal, and then asked for a cup of vinegar at the end of it. She then took out a pearl from her earring, dropped it into the vinegar, and watched it melt. After the pearl was properly melted into the vinegar, she grabbed the cup and drank it completely, showing she'd do anything to win a bet. What makes this a big deal is the fact that the pearl was priceless. This is even mentioned in Pliny the Elder's historical accounts, who called this pearl the largest in all of history, describing it as a wonderful unparalleled natural phenomenon. The truth behind his words and whether he was paid for such praise is a subject of debate. Modern scholars remained skeptical of the story's scientific validity until it was put to the test with actual vinegar and a real pearl. The experiment confirmed that vinegar could indeed dissolve the calcium carbonate in a pearl. Although it would likely take more than a mere day for it to completely dissolve, yet the concept still remains theoretically possible. Subscriber Pick before we move on, it's time for today's subscriber pick where we have yet another weird thing you didn't know about Cleopatra. We know that Cleopatra was ordinary in terms of looks, but in terms of fashion and makeup, she was all about it. Her eye makeup isn't just a modern spin on her look, it was actually a part of her style back in the day. However, what's interesting is that her makeup wasn't just there to make her look good. Nope, not at all. It turns out that Cleopatra's eye makeup had a second more practical use. It was to ward off eye infections. The truth is, many question how eye makeup could ever prevent diseases with the ancient Egyptians even thinking it was magic. Was it magic, though? That's where you, the viewer, come in. Comment down below if you know anything about Cleopatra's eye makeup magic, and if there even is any truth to this myth. Like, for instance, did it even work? Let us know your answers. Now, let's move on to the next weird thing you didn't know about Cleopatra. Number 5. She loved perfumes. Cleopatra's interest in alchemy is well recorded, but she was also an expert in chemistry, which would be a skill set used very well in her perfumes. The reason why she dedicated her skills to perfumes is because she believed in the power of scents, not just for beauty, but as a way to sway people. She knew that the right fragrance could captivate and influence those around her. She took this so seriously that she once infused her ship's sails with perfume before her first meeting with Mark Antony, ensuring that he would be greeted by her scent before her sight on their first encounter. Furthermore, she also ran a perfume factory, an unusual venture for a queen, but practical if the desired fragrances weren't readily available elsewhere. So where was this factory located? It was near the Dead Sea by Ein Gedi, and to top it all off, it even doubled as a spa, complete with seating that suggests a place for beauty treatments or perfume application. The question remains though, could you recreate these very scents today? 
These recipes were clearly important to Cleopatra, so they were documented in Gynae Serum Libri. Unfortunately, though, this is a book that has been lost to history along with Cleopatra's controversial death, which people are still talking about to this day. Number 4. The way she died is debated. Let's talk about Cleopatra's passing, a tale that has been debated for centuries. The story goes like this. Upon receiving news of her defeat by Octavian, the future first emperor of Rome, she composed a farewell letter, entrusted it to a guard, and then met her end through the bite by a venomous snake to her chest. The historical community often engages in debates over such narratives, and this account of Cleopatra's end is no exception. While the notion of succumbing to snake venom within minutes makes for a dramatic story, the reality is that the venom from the asp, the snake in question, would typically require several hours to prove fatal, and sometimes you might even walk away from it. Most historians agree with the idea that Cleopatra did take her own life, yet the exact method remains a mystery. There are accounts of Cleopatra hiding a deadly poison within her hair comb, and the ancient historian Strabo thinks that she might have used a lethal ointment. So many scholars are inclined to believe that she used a sharp pin or needle coated in a powerful toxin, perhaps derived from snake venom, to bring about her demise. Number 3. She was the last pharaoh. Consequently, after her demise, Cleopatra became immortalized as the last pharaoh in Egypt. How did this happen, and why wasn't there a pharaoh after her? It's because Cleopatra's reign was largely driven by noble aspirations for her country, even though she had her own siblings unalived over the course of her rule. Despite that, her primary ambition was for Egypt to maintain its sovereignty, and her endeavors, with the possible exceptions of her indulgent social club and the infamous Pearl Incident, were directed towards this goal. Unfortunately, her vision of an autonomous Egypt perished alongside her, as following her demise in the summer of 30 BC, Octavian annexed Egypt, transforming it into a Roman province, and thus concluding the age of the Egyptian pharaohs. Sadly for her, though, her image went through a period of vilification, particularly from the Romans, who launched what could be described as a character assassination. They depicted her as a seductress, who climbed the ladder of power through manipulation and sorcery, influencing powerful men to her will. A poet centuries later continued to brand her as the disgrace of Egypt and the scourge of Rome, a portrayal that likely pleased the patriarchal Roman rule. This could also explain how sometimes pop culture gets confused and paints Cleopatra as a seductress too. However, not all of history was erased and it's important to remember Cleopatra's reign of over two decades, marked by significant political success, luxurious living, and an end that was by her own design. Number 2. Caesar erected a statue of her. For the next entry on our list, let's talk about the time Caesar erected a statue of Cleopatra, his mistress, right in the middle of Rome. See, what makes this statue really weird and honestly audacious is that Caesar was still married to his wife Calpurnia when he decided to erect a gilded statue of Cleopatra in the temple of Venus Genetrix. One can only imagine the inner turmoil of Caesar's wife as he committed this act, yet it gets even worse. Not only did it brazenly display Caesar's affair, but it also challenged Roman religious sensibilities. Unlike the Egyptians, who viewed their rulers as gods, the Romans did not typically consider their leaders to be divine. As a result, placing an Egyptian queen's statue in a sacred space was a bold move, particularly from someone who was, in essence, the nation's spiritual authority. Despite the Roman populace's outrage over Cleopatra's statue, historian Antony Cam highlights in his book Julius Caesar, A Life, that the statue stood in the temple for over two centuries, even after Cleopatra was denounced as an enemy of the state. This long time suggests that the statue may have held some religious importance, likely tied to Cleopatra's connection with the goddess Isis, who was worshipped by a dedicated, albeit small, cult in Rome. Number 1. She was pregnant while fleeing Rome. Now for our final entry, let's talk a bit about Cleopatra and Caesar's relationship. It started back in 46 BC, when Cleopatra's arrival in Rome alongside Julius Caesar certainly caused a sensation. Far from concealing their affair, Caesar openly acknowledged Cleopatra as his mistress, and she did not shy away from the public eye, bringing along their son Caesarian. Plus, we know that the citizens of Rome were particularly mad about Caesar's decision to build a gilded statue of her, which was seen as a brazen display of their relationship. However, tragedy struck when Caesar was assassinated in the Roman Senate in 44 BC, which obviously meant that Cleopatra had to make a hasty escape from Rome 
There are even some ancient accounts that suggest that Cleopatra was expecting another child with Caesar at the time of her departure. Given the treacherous nature of her journey back to Egypt, people speculate that the ordeal might have led to a miscarriage of the child she carried from her late lover. If these rumors are true, then historians can only sympathize with her, as there are accounts of Cleopatra going to the ship's prow for a tranquil night at sea, where she'd be lost in her thoughts as she gazed into the horizon. We can only imagine what was going through her head during these escapes. And although she was forced to leave Rome, her impact on the empire was unforgettable, especially in the fashion department. Her distinctive hairstyle and pearl adornments set a trend among Roman women, to the extent that, as historian Joanne Fletcher notes, the Cleopatra look became so widespread that many statues of Roman women were mistakenly identified as Cleopatra herself. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.